Well, welcome back to week two of our journey through the New Testament book of Titus. I want to talk to you today about that, about organized religion. You don't have to be a pastor to know that organized religion is not the most popular kid on the current cultural block. Like, if organized religion was a high school student, it definitely wouldn't be voted as the prom king or sit on the homecoming court. If organized religion was a YouTube video, you would see just as many little thumbs down as you would see liked thumbs up. If organized religion was a social media platform, it wouldn't be the uber popular Snapchat or Instagram. What would organized religion be? MySpace, maybe? <laughs> you know, something that used to be popular back in the day, but now it's kind of a joke. At least that's what the Gallup organization said. Uh, Gallup has been surveying Americans for generations, asking them this question, are you a member of an organized religion? A member of a church, a synagogue, or a mosque? Uh, back in 1949, when my parents were born, 76% of Americans said yes. When I was born in 1980, I think about 72% of Americans said yes. And when I graduated from high school in the late 90s, over 70% of Americans still said yes. But you know what happened then? Fifty percent. In the last 20 years, organized religion in America has taken a nosedive. And now only one out of two Americans are officially part of an organized religion like this. 77% of Americans actually say they are religious, but apparently a whole bunch of them aren't very organized about it. So my question for you tonight is, why do you think that is? I mean, every organization has flaws and faults. Groups of people are filled with people, so they're not going to be perfect. So what do you think is so different about now as compared to the year my parents were born? Or the year I was? Or at the turn of the millennium? What's so unique about modern America that so many people would bail on structure and authority like this? I think one of the most powerful answers to that question is... We know. What our grandparents and even our parents and maybe lots of us growing up didn't know, now we know. Through the power of the internet and the boldness of people's confessions, we know now how ugly organized religion can be. I dare you, just post anything about the Catholic Church or priests, or bishops, or televangelists, or megachurch pastors, or organized religion in general, and you'll find out exactly what I mean. The comment section will be filled with the stories that we know. The things we've lived through, the things our families have been through, the lid is off, and people know that priests and pastors and those who have positions of power in organized religion can be very, very bad people. We've seen the abuse. We know the cover-up, the stories of greed, and those who misuse their positions. We've heard about men who were violent, who were bullies, who just used the name of God for their personal gain and their greed. These days we know. And so it's not shocking that a whole generation of people would say, you know what, no thanks. Maybe for grandma and grandpa, but no thanks. I can still be spiritual, I can still pray to God, I can still have a deep relationship with him, but do I need something like this? No thanks. And if you know the stories, it's super tempting to put a period on the end of that statement. There are hypocrites in the church. I'm not interested. End of discussion. 
But before you put a period on that thought and think you don't need a person like me or a community like this, let me ask you a question. In any area of life, can you think of people achieving the highest level of excellence without organization? As you think about athletes or musicians or students or raising kids, do you know any area of life where people grow and maximize their gifts and reach a level of excellence without structure, without organization, or without authority? Even though there are flawed parents and coaches and teachers, do we, do we bail unstructured anything because of its flaws? Like, do, do you ever see a little kid and say, well, he's cute. He probably doesn't need a home. He'll be fine on his own. I mean, look at him. He's so gifted and wonderful. No, we don't say that. You ever seen a second grader where you say, you know what? He could learn a lot about life by sitting in a boat or hanging out in the woods. So who needs this Monday to Friday homework, detentions, principal, teacher kind of thing? You ever seen an NHL star or someone playing soccer at the highest level for Man City or Barcelona FC who never had a coach or a trainer, someone with a whistle in their mouth and authority in their hand? Does anyone get to the level of professional athlete by themselves? No. See, we know in life, if we really want to grow, if we want to be our best, then despite the flaws of people and despite the flaws of organizations that are made up with people, we still need to be organized. The only other option is to fall short of what we could be. So, do you think that could possibly be true for you and your faith? Is it possible that the level of faith that God wants you to achieve, the strength of your spiritual life, is at least somewhat dependent on your connection to an organized religion, on an outside authority, on structure for your spirituality? Is it possible that the God who wants the best for your soul doesn't just think it's nice, but would actually say that it's necessary to be part of something like this? And if so, what about the stories? What about the scandals? What about the abuse? Are we just supposed to say, I guess, and turn a blind eye to all that? Well, the answer to that question, maybe you could have guessed, is to avoid either or thinking. And today that's what we're going to find in the Bible. We're going to open up for the second time to the New Testament book of Titus. And here God is going to give us a powerful and for organized religion. So if you have a Bible with you or a device or you just want to follow along on the screen, we're going to jump in to Titus chapter 1. And we're going to start today with verse 5. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to his good friend Titus. And he says, The reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Uh, if you're kind of new to the Bible, you might not know that Paul and Titus are almost best friends. I don't think they have matching tattoos, but they really, really like each other. Uh, Paul thinks that Titus is one of his most trusted co-workers. He respects his work ethic and his faith, and it would make Paul so, so happy to keep Titus right here at his side. And yet, according to this verse, what does Paul do? He leaves him. He leaves Titus to do ministry on the island of Crete, uh, the biggest island in the Mediterranean Sea. And in this one verse, you see why. Because on the island of Crete, Paul wanted Christians to be organized. <laughs> you catch that in this verse? The reason I left you there was that you might put in order what was left unfinished. And now here's a massively important phrase. And appoint elders in 
every town. So we're to appoint um, is something really official. It means to give someone a position that comes with great responsibility and great authority. Paul wanted Titus to do that, appoint what he calls elders. Uh, elders is just uh, another word in the Bible for overseers or pastors, people like me. Um, you don't have to be elderly, according to the Bible, but you can't be brand new to the faith, and you can't be immature when it comes to the things of God. You have to have a, a spiritual maturity. Thank you for not smiling while I said that up here. <laughs> you have to have you know, some spiritual maturity and be an elder in the faith. And here's the thing that grabbed my attention. Where does Paul want elders? In every town. Like wherever there were Christians on the island, Paul said, Titus, you got to put it in order and you have to appoint an elder. I don't want a single brother, a single sister, any family, any couple, any Christian who's trying to follow Jesus without an appointed elder to oversee their soul. And in this one verse, we find this thread that actually runs through both the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, when God gathered his people for worship, what did he do? He put it in order. He chose the Levites, and then he had the priests, and the high priest, and the prophets. It was organized. In the New Testament, he chose apostles, they appointed pastors, they had deacons. It was organized. From the first page of the Bible to the end, God has this one big idea that his desire for all of his children is not just to be spiritual, it's to be organized and religious. So if you have a pen, uh, grab it and write down our first big idea for today, that what God wants is for his people to be religious. And there are a lot of reasons why. Uh, But today let me demonstrate just one. What would happen if tonight I wasn't standing up here at a different level, but I was sitting right where you were? Like if I scooch down here, the step number two. Hey guys. Hello there. (laughs) Uh, You know the good part about sitting right where you are? Is that it's a good reminder that in most ways I'm exactly on your level. I'm a sinner. You're sinners. Uh, I'm loved by God. You're loved by God. I have the Holy Spirit, just like every Christian here does. I have strengths and weaknesses and gifts and struggles, just like all of you. That's the good part. Do you know the bad part, though, about sitting right here? I can't see you. (laughs) Even though I'm 6'2", I can't, I seriously can't see all of you. So if I talk from down here and you were confused, I couldn't see you. And if something I said really struck you in the heart and tears started to roll down your cheeks, I I couldn't see you. And if you look lost or distracted and needed attention after church, it would be hard for me to see you. But if God called me and appointed me to step up, As a sinner filled with the Spirit, just like you, to have a position that's a little bit different than you, guess what I can do from right here? I can see you. John, I see you way in the back. Brock, I see you right here up front. Richard to my left. Shane on my right. It doesn't matter where you're sitting in this church. I can see you. And that's what God wants for you. He doesn't just want you to show up in some organized place. He wants you to be seen. He wants you to be known. He wants you to be taught. He wants you to be encouraged. He wants you to be corrected. He wants you to be called out. He wants you to be loved. Which is exactly what overseers like me get to do. How many of you have read the Chorus Church directory from A to Z? All right, just me. Uh, How many of you have prayed through the Corps church directory from A to Z? Just me. 
How many of you go through the course church directory to make sure people haven't drifted from Jesus? Just me. How many of you get to spend 15 hours a week studying the Bible and specifically thinking of the faces who will show up on Sunday? I. See, friends, that is the blessing of organized religion. As a pastor, I get to text you and email you and counsel you and teach you. And all those hours I spend in prayer and studying the word, I'm thinking about you. It's why being a guest preacher is the worst gig in the world, because you can preach the, the word, but you haven't seen the people. But when you gather here with your church family, when you're known and loved, the message can get to the heart because I see what you're going through. And I can find the word of God and the passage from God to speak to the people of God. That's the blessing of organized religion. And it's the answer to that really shallow, one-sided thinking that some spiritual people love to use, especially young people, and especially men. All right, so if you're young, or if you're a man, or if you know someone who's young or is a man, listen up. You ever heard some dude say, ah, you know, I don't go to church, but when I'm out in the woods, when I'm sitting on my boat, I just feel close to God. Your answer should be, and... Dude, you're absolutely right. The earth declares the glory of God. I hope you feel close to God when you're out in nature. And who sees you? And who teaches you? And who corrects you? And who knows you? Who calls you out? Who forgives you? Who oversees your soul? Now, what you said is true, but it's not all all the truth. Or when someone says, ah, They're hypocrites in the church, right? Why bother? Your answer should be, um, do you know who knows that even better than you? Do you know who's more bothered by that than even you? God. And do you know what God still said? Appoint elders in every town. Someone busts off that old crack. Oh, being a member of church doesn't make you a good Christian. And (laughs) not being a member of a church will make you a worse one. (laughs) You see, the, the devil loves to end the sentence so quickly. He loves to isolate us. He would love nothing more than for you to be very spiritual, just not seen, not known, not deeply loved by a person who has been called by God to oversee your soul. And that's why a good father wants the same thing for his children as an earthly father wants for his. He doesn't want anyone to be solo. He wants community. He wants family. He wants this. So let me say a quick word to some of the young men who are here today. You know, when I was your age, do you know what I wanted to do? Number one on my list, be a professional soccer player. Number two on my list, be a professional soccer player. Number three, (laughs) study business if the soccer thing didn't work out. But a few years went by, and when I was a teenager reading the Bible in my bedroom, I came across a passage that gave me a deep desire to become this. Jesus said, what good is it if a person gains the whole world and yet gives up his soul? And I thought that day, how, how good must God be? <laughs> like, if you can get everything in the world and it's not worth it, how good must God be? God lit this fire in my heart to think, like, maybe I should be a pastor and tell the world, tell just some how good God can be. And I want to ask some of you who are here today, some of you who are watching online, do you desire the same? It's not an easy job. 
If you want short hours and an uncomplicated life, don't, don't choose this one. But there's nothing else I'd rather do. Sometimes I sit in my office and I open this book with my quick trip coffee right next to me, 10 hours of study ahead, and I think, people pay me for this. <laughs> Caffeine and Jesus. <laughs> And sometimes it blows my mind, like, this is, this is my job. I get, I get to walk around and I get to pray. And it's work. And I get to meet with people and try to listen well and then find the passage that fits best. That's my work. And, and I wonder if some of you who think you're going to be professional athletes or play Fortnite for the rest of your life, uh, I wonder if I could just plant a seed in your heart today that maybe, maybe, God is calling you to step up and to be the next overseer. To pursue and seek God with all your heart until you realize, too, that he is worth everything. And you could stand up here and see people who are searching for joy and life and peace and something better than the short-term pleasure of this world and tell them that it exists and his name is God. (laughs) Guys, I don't know what your future holds, but... I do know this. God wants us to be religious because great things happen when we are. And this is a pretty sweet sermon for a pastor to preach. (laughs) It's pretty convenient for me today, isn't it? Like God wants you all to be here and to respect me and to give money when the basket comes around. <laughs> I mean, like, if there's no and to this message, this would be the most, like, convenient, self-serving, easy message for a pastor to preach, right? Which is why God, who knows what's best, put a comma on that sentence. He wants people to be religious, and here's what he says in Titus chapter 1. Verse 6. An elder, an overseer, a pastor, must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer manages God's household, he must be blameless. You can feel the force of those words, can't you? He must be. He must, if you keep reading, Paul says a third time, he must, and then a fourth, he must. When it comes to this, it's not icing on the cake, it's not nice, there's something that's absolutely necessary, no asterisks, no exceptions, he must be blameless. To stand here, Pastor Michael and I must be blameless. Now, blameless doesn't mean sinless. I mean, Titus would have a pretty tough job if he had to appoint men who were sinless, right? Um, the word blameless essentially means that you wouldn't blame us for picking that pastor. Like, you wouldn't have such a reputation in the church or in the community that if he stood up here to preach, people wouldn't go, wait, what? That guy? That guy is your spiritual leader? Are you serious? Ladies, maybe think of it if one of your girlfriends was going to go on a date with a guy that you knew was a total player. And as soon as you heard, like, she was going to have coffee with this guy, your gut reaction was, oh, no. Oh, no, you're not. (laughs) No, you're hanging out with me tonight because that guy's not good for you. Like, you would blame her for going on a date with him. And, And if that's true when it comes to dating immoral players, how much more true is it when it comes to having immoral pastors? No, pastor must be blameless. And then Paul unpacks what that means. It's pretty interesting in these verses, he doesn't start with what you might suspect. How much does he know? How many hours does he pray? How good is he at public speaking? No, where does Paul start? At home. He says if a pastor is married, he has to be faithful to his wife. If he has kids, he has to be a good dad. If he's going to oversee and manage the house and family of God, make sure he can handle his house and his family 
at home. I think that idea is really powerful for a whole bunch of reasons. Number one, if there's one person in the world who knows exactly what kind of man I am, it's not you. (laughs) You could fake it for an hour. And I could too. But at home, my wife knows exactly if I'm blameless or not. My family sees the best and the worst. They see the ups and the downs. They know really what kind of character I have. And, and this is Paul's advice. Like, what happens at church when the pastor is next to his wife and kids? When you read their emotional health, their body language, what do you find? When someone at church compliments the pastor and his wife is really quiet and avoiding eye contact, what do you notice? Because how can a man possibly love the bride of Christ if he can't love his own bride? How can he disciple the children of God if he can't disciple his own children? And so Paul, who's brilliant, he's single and brilliant, he knows that if you want to know where to start with a man to test his character and his integrity, you look at his closest relationships. Any of you business people ever heard about MBWA? I just learned that term this week. You know what it is? Management by walking around. <laughs> they say in the business world, some of the best leaders don't have these like compelling visions they find in books. What they do best is they walk around. They spend time with people. They get to know what's going on on the factory floor, and and their best ideas and their best encouragement comes from that interaction. And I think Paul knows that too. He knows that what matters is time. That if you have time to walk around at home to date your wife and disciple your kids, if they're super healthy, you're going to know the most important ideas about pastoring a church. If you can do life together with a woman and kids who are very different than you are, who have different preferences, different gifts, different strengths, and different struggles, and your home is still blessed because you're not totally selfish, you might be ready to step up and teach and lead the people of God. So Paul says, look for a pastor who's blameless, faithful to his wife, connected with his kids. Uh, In other words, find a pastor who's a little bit like Pastor Tim. Any of you know Pastor Tim from our church? He's the lead overseer of our ministry. Um, There are many things I respect about Pastor Tim, but here are two. Number one, I see him dating his wife all the time. You'll see Tim and Holly, I think they've gone to every restaurant in this entire city. (laughs) They love to eat, and when I see them together, she looks happy. And that makes me respect him as a man. And the second thing I respect is the picture I took the other day without his permission. (laughs) I have a Monday meeting every week with Pastor Tim, and he's a little bit late to arrive. Uh, But I noticed this picture in his office, and I took a picture of him, and I want to show it to you. This is the picture. It's from his only daughter's wedding. (laughs) And I love the expression on both of their faces. I love the body language as she holds on to her dad. And I love the message that his daughter put on the sign before she gave it to her father. That yes, she was leaving home. Yes, there was a new man who would be closest to her in life. But he would never forget the faithful father who raised her. And Paul said to Titus, find guys like Tim that date their wife, that spend time raising their kids. And Paul had to say something else. (laughs) Because if you all paid my salary, and I just went out to eat with Kim and spend time with my kids, I'm probably going to get fired, right? (laughs) 
And that's why Paul has one last thing to say. Now, look at our last verses for today. Here's what else an overseer must be. He must not be overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what's good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Now, you should know about this list that it's a little bit subjective, and it's not like a one-time offense. You can't say, I saw Pastor Mike lose his temper and scream at the, the screen during a soccer game once, so he can't be our pastor anymore. Now, this, this is like character qualities that become such an issue that something gets in between the man and the message. All right? And Paul has a bunch of examples. If the pastor's overbearing, if his personality is so threatening that people feel afraid to express their opinions or concerns, he's not blameless. If he's given to drunkenness, if you're noticing how much he drinks at the party and are concerned he's going to get behind the wheel, he's not blameless. If he pursues dishonest gain, if, if you're a little bit nervous about the church credit card and are even unsure about giving an offering that that man might have a connection to, he's not blameless. Instead, Paul says he must be hospitable. Um, the Greek word there means to love other kinds of people. So if he's white, he has to love people who aren't. He's male, he has to love women too. He might be older, he has to love teens and kids. He might be a citizen of this country, he has to love people from other backgrounds. He might be a Christian, he has to love Muslims and atheists just the same. He must be hospitable. And he must love what's good. The word of God, every chapter, every verse, the commandments, the promises. And I love this part. He has to be self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Um, do you know the tricky part about my job? For most of it, no one is watching me. I, mean, I spend a good 10, 15 hours doing counseling and classes, but the, the bulk of what I do is to study the Bible and pray. And none of you know if I am. Am I faithfully preparing for a sermon all week? Or am I jumping to sermons.com, copy, paste, change a few stories? Hey, hey! Am I devoted in prayer for your soul, for your family, your faith? Or am I having my buddy Tom put Call of Duty on the big screen and playing until it's next Sunday? Um, if a pastor is not self controlled, and disciplined, he will waste the time and the opportunity to oversee his church. And so he has to be that. He must be. You have to trust that when you appoint the man and you give an offering to support his salary, that's a good investment and not a waste. And if you can pass all these qualifications, Paul says, you are ready. You are righteous. And religion can work in the right way. So here's a message as much for me as it is for you, but I want you to write it down anyway. God doesn't just want people to be religious. Secondly, he wants pastors to be righteous. He wants us to be righteous. Which is why I used to wear this. Back at my first church, uh, we did worship in a bit more of a traditional way. Back then when I started, I was the pastor who wore the robe. The ministry man dress, right? All white. I got the slim cut because I'm scrawny. I put that robe on every day. And this is what went over the top. I was like a Christian rapper, right? Just, <laughs> just without the bling. I wear this little symbol. And uh, this is a reminder of two things for me. Number one, it was a reminder of my call that I was appointed as a pastor. Not everyone walked in with a pastoral bling, but I did. I had a responsibility. And it was also a reminder that this was really close to this. That I don't just have outward authority. God's called me to have inward integrity. And if I'm going to lead people to Jesus without offense, I have to make sure my character is as much like Jesus 
as it can be. And that's why today, uh, I want to ask you for a favor. I'm asking for the next seven days, would you pray for your pastors? For Mike and Mike, for Tim and Jim, for Bill, for the five overseers of St. Peter and the Corps, would, would you pray for us? Here's why. Because our church is doing really well. I mean, the spot that we're at in ministry right now is so exciting. Two campuses, new building, adding services, more people than we've ever had worshiping in our ministry's history. We started a partnership with Time of Grace that connects and engages over 4.5 million times every single month. People hear about Jesus Random teenagers email me around the world about Jesus. We are giving Jesus and the gospel to more people than ever before. God has lifted us up to this incredible platform to proclaim the gospel. So how ugly would it be if we became the next story? If I cross some line in a counseling relationship, if Pastor Michael had one too many and got behind the wheel. If Pastor Tim scared people and they didn't feel comfortable talking, if things got violent in the heat of the moment, how ugly would that be if we seriously had to sit down and figure out what next? How much damage would that cause if we had to take our eyes off of Jesus and off of the cross, off of the message of eternal life, and instead we had to think about the man or the men? And so we really need you to pray. I mean, it's amazing to be up here to talk to you, but if things fell apart, if I stepped off this platform into sin, lots of people would get hurt. So pray that we are holy and disciplined and righteous. That the worst thing you'd have to worry about when you show up here is not my character or my integrity, but the length of my rambling messages. (laughs) Pray. Because we need it. Because here's the amazing thing. If I can be that righteous, and if you can be that religious, we can talk about Jesus. If you're rooted in the spiritual habits of religion and you show up here long enough that we get to see you, then we can give you Jesus. And I love just in this moment looking out at your faces, knowing that you're going through surgery and you want your second marriage to be better than the first, that you're so worried about your daughter's addiction that you're not sure if organized religion is worth it, that you hope your 21-year-old gets rerooted in the gospel. You're scared about someone you love and the decisions that they've made. You're grieving the loss of the woman who was your mentor. You're trying to do life after the conviction, after the death, after the abuse. I, I see you. I know you. So listen. As I preach, you brothers and sisters are the people of God. He chose you. The girl might not choose you. Your ex might not have chosen you. The people at work might not notice you, but God, God chose you. And he is with you. Whatever happens this week with with your kids, with your spouse, with your job, with your health, with, with your bank account, There is nothing that can touch the hope you have of eternal life. And when you feel unworthy of it, listen to me. There is grace. The gift you don't deserve, the thing you don't see coming, it's yours because of what Jesus did. When there's nothing in my character that gets in the way, and when you're here to hear the words that I speak, we speak life, we find hope, and our hearts rest in peace as we live in the presence of God. That's what he wants for you. 
It's what he wants for us. So if I promise to be as righteous as I can, will you promise to be as religious as you can? I hope so. Because I want you to experience what these religious people experienced. Do you know the story of Nehemiah chapter 8? God's people, the Israelites, have been taken off into exile, dragged from their homes to a place called Babylon. And about 70 years later, they came back home. They rebuilt the temple and the ancient walls of Jerusalem. And on one incredible day, they gathered as organized religious people. This chapter in the Bible says they actually built a platform so that the priest, the appointed man of God, could stand up and they could see him. And he unrolled the scroll and he gave them the word of God. And as people listened, two things happened. Some didn't get it. And some were saddened by it. That ever happened to you when you read the Bible? Like... Uh. <laughs> or sometimes you just see what God wants and you're just so sad that you didn't do it. Which is why I love organized religion. Because when the priests and the Levites, led by Ezra, when they saw the grief and the sadness of the people, they didn't stop preaching. Instead, they scattered among the crowds to the people that they had seen. They taught them exactly what the word of God meant. And Ezra preached this incredible word. He says, do not grieve, not today, because of God. The joy of the Lord is our strength, Ezra preached. (laughs) And you can read it for yourself. Apparently the people went, they ate a bunch of sugar. That's literally in the Bible in Nehemiah chapter 8. They had these sweet drinks and treats, and they celebrated not just because it tasted good in their mouth, but because the message of their overseers felt so good in their soul. Which is why I hope I can see you next Sunday. I know you're busy. I know work's crazy. I know a thousand things want your attention. But there are going to be times when you're sad, when you're confused, when you're looking for life. And if I can see you, and if you can hear me, I promise you this. I'll give you God. And the joy of the Lord can be your strength too. Let's pray. Uh, Dear Father, thank you for religion. Not just some vague spirituality, God. Thank you for people in our life who knew us, who saw us, who loved us enough to both encourage and correct us. I pray, God, for everyone today who's not a member of a church who's not deeply rooted in spiritual habits and overseen by someone who has the authority of God to love them well, I pray that this would change their thinking. I pray that this would be the day when religion would stop being a nice thing for other people, but in their hearts would become a necessary thing for all people who are your people. Along with our church, God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to spur them on to pray, that the prayers of a few would be multiplied. And that all of our overseers would be protected by your Holy Spirit to resist sin and instead find everything we need in God. Lord, help us to be those kind of men. Help us to be that kind of church. It's a fun season to do ministry here, God. Help nothing to get in the way of the bold proclamation of Jesus. We pray it all with confidence because we know who we are. We are your children who can celebrate today because your joy is our strength. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's religious people join their voices and said, Amen.